This is Greg Green with Kathonica, the show about horror and all its fictional forms. And I have a, a really exciting episode today. Um, uh, we're going to talk about adapting horror from page to screen. And I'm so excited because I have three distinguished guests. Um, we have the uh, uh, writer of Horror, Noir, and the Weird, and author of The Imago Sequence, Occultation, The Beautiful Thing That Awaits Us All, Swift to Chase, those collections, as well as the Isaiah Coleridge trilogy and the novel The Croning. Laird Barron. Laird, how are you today? Hey, I'm great. Uh, I might be coughing a bit because I have allergies, but I'm really pleased to be here with these gentlemen. Great to have you back on the show. Uh, we also have a horror writer and author of The Gulp, The Fall, The Rue, uh, and the collection uh, Served Cold, as well as the brand new novel, Sallow Bend. Uh, joining us across the expanse of time, or at least time zones, we have Alan Baxter. How are you, Alan? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Great to have you on the show. Uh, and then we have Philip Gillat, the uh, writer, director, and producer. You know him from the Emmy Award winning animated series Love, Death, and Robots, as well as uh, he's the creator of the rotoscope animated spectacular The Spine of Night, which came out just a couple of years ago and is uh, an amazing piece of work. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, adapting a couple of stories, one from Laird, one from, one from Alan, uh, adapting them from page to screen. But um, I want to start with the story. 30. This is from Laird's 2010 book, Occultation, adapted to screen as the 2017 film They Remain, starring William Jackson, Harper, and Rebecca Henderson. Uh, Laird, what do we need to know about your story, 30? Uh, just real quick, it's, it's kind of fascinating, you know, since we're talking about the adaptation process and result, that it's eminently Phil's adaptation it's like one of the mo most faithful adaptations an author could desire. And yet at the same time, it's utterly unfaithful in certain, in certain ways because the story contained disparate threads and he chose, and the cinematographer, how, how he filmed it, Sean Kirby, kind of foregrounded certain elements and, and let others blur into the background. And I found that fascinating. But, but essentially, it's as someone has described it, uh, it's sort of akin to shine, the shining, but, it, but, it, you know, in the wilderness, uh, yes. in a, you know, in a tent setting and a couple uh, scientists, a couple biologists are studying aberrant behavior uh, in the story. They're uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the high desert and they're isolated for, you don't really know. It's kind of a murky, there's sort of a murky backstory, but they're there for a while. They're cut off and things are increasingly destabilized around them, uh, starting with their own relationship and progressing to the, the animal behavior around them, or maybe it's the inverse of that. And one last little detail about it. I got the inspiration for it um, from events in my own life. There's a couple incidents in the story that are lifted directly from creepy things that happened to my family when I was a kid uh, in the wilderness in Alaska. And Another huge chunk of it comes from an actual CSI investigation of the Barker Spawn Ranch back in the early mid-aughts. Uh, CSI team went out there and they were looking for mass graves. And I read that story and I said, wow, that's creepy. Because they spent some time out there with their, with their uh, radar ground detecting units and their, their uh, cadaver dogs. And I just thought to myself, I could just see this image of them sitting out at night, you know, by a campfire with who knows what buried beneath them and they never did find anything really wow. but just the the idea really got me thinking it creeped me out uh and i would say also as far as the film goes um and maybe the story too to some degree but the film for sure kind of belongs i think it, it has a kinship to other genius loci type of films or or uh supernatural intrusion that's sort of amorphous uh, and starts affecting people's psychology subtly and then more radically would be like session nine, um, Stalker, uh, uh, Sauna from uh, 2007, the Finnish, the Finnish movie, which is one of my very favorite movies, kind of in that. It's, it's at one, it's nothing like those movies, but on an, if you look at them carefully, that idea of nature or uh, something has settled into 
an abandoned or if not rural wilderness sort of uh, environment and doesn't really want you there. But you've mentioned, I haven't seen it yet. It's on my watch list, but phase four, the seventies mm -hmm. movie about, about ants. Um, right. is, is there some influence there? Because the weird animal behavior in particular insects, not limited to them, but weird animal behavior is a, a crucial part of the story <laughs> was, is phase four related to this in any way? Yeah, and the thing, um, but that, those two, so people have, I think, misattributed it. And, and perhaps I contributed to that, right? You, you think about your work and, and things that you've watched differently as you, as time goes by. I look at the things that I loved years ago and I either love them more or, or was, maybe my relationship is, you know, in, intensified or maybe it's cooled. But, um, you know, when I'm talking about the film, and these other movies, like say Stalker is a good example, and Session Nine is another really good one. That's more of the, there's like the, the, the soul of the piece. Yes. Right? The, maybe the core of it. The connections uh, that Phase Four possesses is much more architectural uh, surface level. Like it's more the paint and it's more the, it's more the smell that comes off and it's more visual texture. So L literally architectural in some sense with phase four, because phase four has the has domes in the desert. Yeah. Right. And, yes. and, and the reason that I draw a distinction though between the importance of those uh, between those two elements, the the the, the, the genius loci versus the allusions to these other movies, is because one is cosmetic and the other one is foundational. So yes. in other words, I didn't have to I chose to go for, I even said it, Howard Hawks. I wanted you to think about dry, high desert. And obviously for the movie, it was changed to a temperate setting, which I think actually, that's another way that it's, it's, it's unfaithful and yet it foregrounds another element of the story that is eminently faithful. But the, but the whole point was, is to talk about, and then of course there's an allusion to the thing, the same thing where the guy, uh, Kurt Russell, pour, you know, McCready pours, alcohol into a, a computer and I, and I just made a joke that yeah he burned the damn place right. down that's what would really would have happened yeah. but those are it's like I it's like what I normally do with pop culture references I won't say they're they're unimportant but they're surface they're they're what they're the shiny things that when someone first starts reading it and a certain type of reader doesn't care about digging into it oh this is that's that's pulling them along they see the desert they you know, phase, you know, maybe if you watch phase four or maybe they'll go, you know, uh, somebody will talk about it and they'll go watch the movie. But it's it's a certain atmosphere. But the atmosphere is obviously not that important because look how Phil transported it to a, yes. a green setting, right? Yes. And, and I believe that was um, upstate New York where it was filmed, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, uh, Phil, uh, obviously there's significant <laughs> risk in making any feature film. What did 30 have that convinced you to adapt it to film? Oh, uh, so many things. But I think, you know, when I think back on the process of it from the very beginning, I think the, the thing that that um, most convinced me to do it was that I found the story so befuddling. Like I'm, I'm very attracted to uh, like mystery and the idea of mysteries that you can't solve. And, and just like, I think it was like the story sort of um, got into my head in a way that I just wanted to spend time picking it apart and trying to figure out what I thought that it was about uh, either in a mood sense or a theme sense or a character sense uh so so there were there was that sort of like creative impulse which which was was um i think probably in more uh um argumentative statements about the story i, I think i've said like i was frustrated by it and i wanted to make other people frustrated by it as well because i found it like a, like a sort of a satisfying frustration like i like i like a work that i have to um and not argue with, but interrogate to try to get some kind of meaning out of. Um, so there, there was all that. And then, you know, I knew that we were going to have to do it as an indie film. So, uh, you know, there were, there was the creative inspiration. And there was also sort of the, the fact that it was really, there were only, well, there's three characters, dot, 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 question mark on screen, but really basically it's two uh, and you have one interior location. And then all you really need other than that is, you know, uh, uh, an exterior that you can shoot, you know, for days and days and days. So I thought that it was, uh, in a material sense, achievable. Like I thought I could make it. Uh, so those two things combined really are are what was was the spark. Laird, regarding film optioning in general, when a filmmaker comes to you wanting to option one of your stories, what do they need to bring to the table to win your approval? They actually have to 
initially win my agent's approval. Um, and I think that's actually kind of how it worked in this case too. I'm, I don't remember the whole process because a lot of stuff had happened. I didn't even know about it until it was the deal was kind of farther along. But uh, so generally you have to get past Puya Shabazian, who's a really great ruthless agent of mine. But for me, um, I, I looked at the, um, the, the screenplay and we might have already even had the deal done at that point. I don't remember, but I do know that we talked on the phone for a couple hours and I watched Europa report and was blown away. Phil wrote that. And I like the film just in general anyway, but the writing was really excellent. And then he, he sent me a sort of like an initial draft of the script. And I, I honestly had to go check with my story because the writing that he improvised or you created on his own to, to supplement, you know, to basically tweak it so that it could be filmed was so similar to what I would have written that I actually had to double check. And I said, okay, this is really, you know, and, and the writing was just really well done. I've looked at a lot of scripts yeah. of my work over the years. Yeah. And I got to tell you, most of the time, not not very good like it would, wow. be a take, it would be a take the money and run this was and i've had a couple other cases where just really great great scripts and this is this is one of the finest scripts so i mean but look what what phil has done i mean spine on spine on night it's a classic yeah. I, I say that without reservation that is a classic that if that would have come out around the time of heavy metal we'd, we'd be you know 20 years from now we're going to be saying that was our fire and ice um heavy metal as you said, Lord of the Rings, yep. The Hobbit, you know, the Rankin Bass stuff. That's it's right in there. And then, of course, I haven't actually. I'm, I, I'm remiss. I haven't watched the third season of uh, Love, Death, and Robots, but I watched the first two, and you know, it's just great writing. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Phil, is speaking about of like faithfulness to <laughs> Laird's story. I mean, yeah, some sections of dialogue are straight out of. Laird's text uh, to me there's at least having read the story a couple times and watched rewatched the film just in the last few days it seems like there's very little in the film that isn't in the story um tell me about I mean was faithfulness to the source material important to you and how do you def how do you define faithfulness in a screen adaptation yeah. what does that mean to you uh um so faithfulness to a text is super important to me. I, I don't know, but we'll get to Alan eventually. I don't know how Alan feels about how Involved in Tombs came out, but like it applies both to love my sort of philosophy and adaptation of Love, Death and Robots and definitely to 30 and anything else that I would do. And I think it's it's tricky because you can't, you have to, um, you know, there's like the Zack Snyder Watchmen problem, right? Which is that like, it's entirely faithful, but also completely misses the point. So I, I think you have to really uh, try to dig into what it is about the story that has attracted to it, attracted you to it in the first place, and then um, be faithful to that as well as sort of in a similar spirit to how Laird was talking about it, like you know, be faithful to the um, mechanics of the story where it's necessary, but then also more principally to the spirit of the story. I mean, in, in um, for 30, I did a thing I've never done before or, or since, which is I, I took, I like printed the story out and I like, I had a notebook and I cut it up, like cut the whole thing up into, into paragraphs. And yeah. um, I wish I had it. I think I probably have it, still have it somewhere. And then uh, sort of reordered things and tried to like, um, in a certain sense, re-edit the story, uh, focusing on what might make a scene, what what descriptions of things were were similar, and then um, like a kindergartner took uh, rubber cement and like pasted it into this notebook with, yeah. with gaps in between, so that I could then like write little notes and and sort of you know construct like a, a treatment basically. Um, and some of that was taking. Um, you know what was interior in the story and turning it into into dialogue uh because some of because some of the writing was so good in the short story that i wanted to turn it um you know put it in somebody's mouth so the words yes. were there yes. uh and then some of that was like rearranging scenes there was it, it's such a tricky story to adapt um like some other things Larry's talking about too because it it's you know it is all it's almost entirely a mood piece right like the plot of it is yeah. is almost just a, a to b really but it's all about like the, the that gap between a and b and what you can do there so 
yeah. even you know probably the difference in story order between the script that Laird read what we shot and then what we edited other than like the very first scene and the very last scene which were always the first and the last scene everything else is was sort of up for grabs in terms of like trying to to reorder them um but all of that was you know in in trying to stay true to the spirit of of again that my initial like sort of frustrated reading of the short story like I just wanted to I wanted to recreate that and and so as much um like mystery and ambiguity in into the story as possible so that you could you know to to make the the audience mad that there was no answer <laughs> was, yes. was, was really sort of the I, the impetus there <laughs> I just like to say one thing about all that there's two th a couple of things that are really eerie about the adaptation because we didn't we just talked for a couple hours I mean he, and he'd already made up his mind about what he was you know his initial thoughts about it so we didn't really get a chance to really go into a lot of stuff but how he shot it was sort of like like you were talking uh we were off camera we were talking about word length of the story and how do you you know get the the mileage out of the word like well I wrote it with the idea of like, like these long just long scenes of light changing and so it was really interesting that Phil and crew interpreted that way without me really going into that with them that was just they picked up on that but the other thing is is talking about the cutting and pacing that's how I I wrote it I think we all as writers sometimes work backwards and jump around you know, in our draft I literally wrote 99 percent of it had the had the whole thing done and then I started cutting it apart a word processor I didn't use glue but I I, I actually Hot once tip, I use glue next time yes rubber cement right yeah. uh, I had a through line I had it from A to B as you say but when I was basically done I started cutting it up and moving it around and I did part of that just based on weird, like I had a couple of nightmares while I was writing it. And I just said, no, this has to go. And I realized the story is actually a nightmare in a lot of ways. It's a hallucination. It's a fever dream. It's unreliable. And so, yeah, I, that's very bizarre that you filmed it that way because I wrote it that way almost exactly. I'm curious, Al Alan, I saw you nodding your head just a little bit there. Does that, is, does that surprise you, that approach? Or does that sound like, I mean, have you used any, uh, like an approach like that before yourself? Yeah, I've, I've done it before. Um, not often, but I have. I, I've, a lot of the time, I'm very much of that opinion that, you know, the first draft is you telling yourself the story. Um, and until you've done that, you don't know what it's about. So, yeah. you know, no matter how sort of strongly you feel what you're writing. Um, and there have been a couple of occasions where I've gotten to the end or close to the end of a thing and been right. Oh, OK, all right. I, I see what this is about now. This needs to be told a bit differently. And yeah, and then you sort of yeah, chop and change again. Not not with the rubber cement. And same as Laird, use the word processor <laughs> to do it. Um, but I've I've done that before. Or you know, on on rare occasions, which is just hell. But suddenly realize that you've got the story right, but the point of view is entirely wrong. Um, wow. So you know, you need to rewrite from a different character, or you need to rewrite from first to third, or vice versa. And so, uh, oh. yeah. The, 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 thankfully for me, at least, it, it's rare. Um, but it does happen. And so, yeah, sometimes you just have to get the story, like, you know, you put it up on blocks and just rebuild it from underneath. It's kind of, yeah, it sucks when it happens, but it's always, when you realize it's, it's always better for the process, you know, so. <laughs> the the cut and paste literally with rubber cement, fa is, I just think that's fascinating. You know, like the structure needed to complete a good, effective short story or novelette or novella or novel is going to be different uh, for, for each one of those forms but then you take it over to a to a screenplay or are you trying to take a story and stretch it over a cinematic framework part of the challenge to myself in adapting it was to was to not um even think about a three-act structure really when I was doing it because I feel like a lot of screenplay writing um is too dogmatically attached to that idea so yeah. so Part of the thrill for me was to take a story that that really wasn't, I think, to like a standard, like almost mathematical screenwriting mind. Like it wasn't clear what the acts were in this story at all, and 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 undergo a process like an adaptation process that really, uh, you know, I was just like, I I don't know where the acts are. We're just gonna we're just gonna write it how it is, and then and then see where see where the beats land on the on the you know, it, within the script. I think what was interesting then was um and I I don't want to say I had arguments with my producers but we had discussions <laughs> about like like what are the act breaks in the story and I mean and eventually 
you know, at a certain point, I, I would I was able in my own head to say, okay, well, it, it, were this were this a traditional story, like the 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 shifts in character that are happening here, here, and here are sort of um, you know signifiers of what one might traditionally call act breaks. But uh, uh, and I think it's still, I mean, I guess what was interesting to me was that it was eventually, even though I didn't write it with act breaks in mind just the shape of a screenplay sort of things end up curving that way anyway, um, which was, which was interesting from, a, I don't know, screenplay educational, st educational standpoint, but I didn't consciously do a lot to like hammer it into that mm -hmm. form but just because I, I didn't, I didn't want to, because I was worried that it would, again, to your previous question with that it might ruin what was, um, what I loved about the story and, and it would, I would no longer have been true to it, you know, um, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Well, right, because that uh, like a three act structure is a, emotionally a regular structure that audiences are trained to under not maybe cognitively understand, but emotionally understand. And um, and now this piece is really unsettling. It's really not. Um, I mean, you taking could, you along a, a structure you're familiar with. I mean, I could just just think about like in my head now probably re-break it to like our traditional Hollywood three act structure where it's like, you know, scientists end up in the wilderness and at about page 30, they're like attacked by an animal. And then for yeah. like, or maybe 15 and then at 30, they realize it's like, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like you could, yeah. you could, you could, you could track that same thing and it would become a little bit more like a traditional animal attack movie or something with its, with its plot beats that way. But that's not interesting <laughs> to me. Yeah. It's certainly not in, in, in taking on the story to adapt, you know? Yeah. So um, were there uh, were there practical concerns for the production that shaped your adaptation? Because like you selected it based on knowing that hey, it's it's really a, mostly a two hander, um, yeah. and it's in one location, um, and and so this it'll fit within your production budget, etc. But were there other aspects of how you uh, wrote the screenplay, uh, you know, for practical concerns? Oh, uh, I mean, I would say even though I wrote it to be economical in terms of our budget. There were things that in the script that I wasn't able to do. Uh, you know, there were um, you know, there's like sort of you know dream sequences in the movie that I'm I'm very happy with how it turned out, but they aren't as scripted because what I had scripted was sort of you know bigger or um, I mean the the one if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it like to get yeah. to get the tax credit in New York is real filmmaking nonsense now you have to shoot one day at least one day on a sound stage of some of some type so i knew that we were going to have to leave our location drive to albany and like shoot something in a sound stage right so uh, it, without a mind i had written dream sequences that were like you know i was like oh what what's an easy thing to build on a sound stage so i i I was thinking we would be able to build like a uh, some sort of like pit uh and we were going to do some like dream sequences in the pit the art department was unable to do that so if you and i probably shouldn't tell you what we shot on the sound stage because it's it's actually quite embarrassing but we went we went to the sound stage uh and shot i think it's like two shots of the movie which is a real it's a it's a heartbreaker from a, a very tightly budgeted low budget independent movie perspective because it's like I mean, again, it's a whole day. You go there and you, yeah. you do two shots because you have to because you need to get this this tax break. Um, and and so there's there's stuff like that that I wanted to do that I just I think probably every movie you're like oh I'll be able to do this this and this and at a certain point you you know the rubber hits the road and you either for time money or you know whatever reasons you just can't you can't do it. Um, but I'm pretty happy. I mean, we managed to pull uh, the the dream stuff in the movie. I'm pretty happy with, and I think it's yeah I think it all works. So. Yeah. Um, Laird, I wonder if you have any other thoughts just about the structure going from the structure of your prose story to the to the film. Oh, like I said, Bill taught me some things about analyzing that story and just I actually utilized it to look at some of my work that I'd written prior and going forward, I've actually used it. Um, there were that basically he could have filmed that as three or four different types. I mean, it would have been essentially the same movie, but the way this um, sort of foregrounded is almost a science fiction movie, mm -hmm. um, but it could have been more gothic horror. It could have been more animal survival and it could have been a cult because you have the cult thread, you mm -hmm. have the weird aberrant animal behavior. And you also have just the alien paranoia of what's, because not just the area, there's the unreliableness. Yes, but is, there, is the company they're working for 
which yeah. by the way that would harken to alien things like that i mean i'm i i love my influence i'm a, i believe in the ecstasy of influence and <laughs> you don't operate in a vacuum and i know that i'm on some subconscious level when i was writing it it was, certainly wasn't in my forebrain but i'm thinking about yeah the paranoia of corporations controlling us Comp yeah. not even just a corporation like just a company like mining companies and logging companies and railroads and you name it right which is all ubiquitous in our consciousness when we talk about the wilderness those are trespassing like you're 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 the emma these two these two people are about as uh you know we love biologists right they're they're out to do to live in harmony with the wilderness and yet they're working for this company and what are they so are there emissaries surveyors of basically uh uh, you know, cor corporate corporatized exploration that just destroys, you know, devours everything in its path, which is lurking beneath the surface and it creates creates the paranoia. But and the male <laughs> character wonders for a moment: um, we, Do they know about his past relationship with the female scientist? And is that why? Is that what's really going on? Are they studying the two of them together for some reason? He just and that's just noted in there just for a moment. But there are a few other clues. You know, well. The, the boss calling in, you know, him talking to the boss and and kind of throwing her under the bus a little bit. The boss asking about how things are going between the two of them, and you you do wonder about that. Some that that element, I feel exists within the original story, but yeah. I feel that that was enhanced dramatically, if if if, if subtly. But you know, if you're looking at like a formula, he added Phil Phil added to that and developed that idea to the degree that that became like something that is going to be in the audience's mind but the only other thing i'll say about it is just that um so he so he taught me that he taught me you know that could have been three or four different type uh, versions of that movie and it would have been an entirely different movie on the surface level if it would have been taking place in the snow or the, the high desert or whatever each one of these would have would have framed the story differently even though the, the heart of it would be the same but uh the other to go back to what we were discussing earlier is the, the act structure I will say this, at this point I've written, you know, for 20, been publishing for about 22 years, and I now have a body of work, and the luxury of having a body of work is, if you're, if you're, if you're allowed to write and publish long enough and explore, I have different threads that I follow. I have my pulp, I have my weird literary stuff, and I have um, kind of stuff in the middle. This is, 30 is, of a you know of 20 or so stories that i have probably that are these bizarre i consider amorphous actless at least they try to resist resist the act structure so they're you can impose you can impose order upon them but 30 like a few of my other stories was expressly written that's why i chopped it up i didn't just reorder it i literally just took things out of order and said no this is where this is going to go because it's confounding and yet it still it's yet it somehow still works Phil picked up on that. I didn't talk to Phil about that at any length. This is just stuff that Phil, through his own creative process, identified with and did it. But yeah, my whole approach to weird to weird fiction, when I when I write hardcore weird fiction, it's not horror. It's it's like more grounded in the weird. Is to resist um, acts. I I re, I think of it as shapes. That story had a shape. Uh, another story that's similar to it, although it's more pulpy, is the siphon literally has a structure structure and then there's this weird bulge at the end like there's just a bunch of stuff that happens where it's not supposed to happen in a traditional three act narrative and then i then you get a coda and then you get another coda and i realized this is just what i wanted to do and so it was perfect i think phil was you know one of the perfect people to have seized him. i don't know if anybody else would have been interested in doing this because that's just what this story was I, I would, I'll just say, man, if, if we can get the siphon adapted to film, I would love to see <laughs> that. that um, and, and did, uh, Laird, did you, um, other than a conversation for a couple of hours with Phil, did you have, do any like consultation in terms of the screenwriting, the production process? Did you visit the set? Did you field questions during the shoot? Any, any other involvement no, on your part? Not really. I mean, we probably exchanged a few emails and mm -hmm. it was a kind of a long process. If I recall the process was well over a year yep. and right yep. and um also just the whole and this is nothing to do with phil just my experience with the hollywood side of things it's extremely extremely secretive clandestine wary like you know uh things can fall apart i mean i 
like look at the Batgirl film, right? They filmed this $93 yeah. million dollar film and nobody's ever going to, well, they'll see it eventually, but it's, it's done, right? <laughs> nobody's going to see it for now, right? I mean, so nothing's ever, this business, I know an author, they had deals canceled as they were, they had like, get ready to sign, like, oops, I've had that happen a couple of times. Like literally the contracts are, we're all looking at them and, they, and then it's over. So wow. yeah, so I, I didn't have any, input i didn't really want any though and i wasn't i wasn't uh i felt that i could pick up the phone and talk to bill i felt like if i had any concerns i could have but i gotta tell you um you know there's a couple aspects to it one once you sign your soul away to sell a piece of your work to either a publisher or hollywood you're kind of going to take the money and walk away this yeah. situation and i have I'm not precious about my work. I'm like, nope, I signed it. It could turn out to just be a pile of crap and I'll just go, Alan Smithy, you know, I had nothing to do with that. I'm just owning it. Uh, but in this case, I wasn't at all worried. I was just curious because I knew he would, you can't read the script that I read and it was just a draft and then watch your Rover report and have our conversation and have any worry and then see who, who was being hired. Like yeah. when I saw Sean Kirby, was being brought in i i you know maybe it was naive but i actually i had no i was just like this is gonna be great wow yeah shot we should yeah shot, so sean kirby was the dp he's uh he's fantastic he hasn't shot that much stuff he's been doing documentaries <laughs> for a while now but he's even his documentaries are just arty and exquisite uh so any, anything shot by sean somebody should you should watch it <laughs> yeah. I, I would love to actually hear i'm glad you bring brought up sean and and i've seen the movie uh, three times now i believe and and uh, from the beginning i just knew like there's something re really unique about this because th there are uh, some relatively long shots of the woods and the landscape and i'm surprised at just the moments we have just to see nature and and those shots are gorgeous uh, just tell us a little bit about Sean's work, Phil, and in, the, in particular the color palette he was going uh, going for there. Uh, I know that there was a there was a moment where uh, you know you see him like uh, as he's heading out right before he discovers the helicopter. There's this, uh, and then he he's he hasn't discovered that his water is being poisoned, but you you know something's really messed up and. Uh, he's going out right before he discovers the helicopter. There's this shot of him where I think the angle, the camera angle is dutched just a little bit and the trees behind him are just gold. And I said to myself, oh, Autumn, he's heading for the fall, you know, and you know, he's <laughs> just about in there. Tell, tell us about the uh, kind of the use of colors here. You're like stretching this from, I think it starts in August and the mission in the, in the movie, the mission's going to end in um, yeah. October. It's three months instead of the, the prose version, which is six months. Um, tell us a little bit about um, Sean's work here. Uh, I mean, where to start? I mean, the, the, I'm glad you noticed the leaves because we, we just, uh, uh, one of our brilliant ideas, which I'm sure every <laughs> asshole director thinks is a brilliant idea at some point, and it's just a nightmare to do. We, we thought we would shoot in order, which is, you know, again, you're like, oh yeah, we'll shoot a movie in order. And, and part of the reason we wanted to shoot it in chronological order is because of the leaves. We thought, oh, if you, if you can keep, um, you know, because we shot in, I guess it was November, so we in early enough in November or maybe late October, the leaves hadn't changed yet. Maybe it was October. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? We shot over the period of what of the time when the movie took place. <clears throat> and part of that was to capture this, this change in the leaf color. Of course, then when I re-edited the order, as we were just talking about, some of that gets fucked up. Oh, pardon my French, screwed up. Uh, and so, um, but we I think we did manage to retain it enough that it's noticeable that it does go from from, from green to, to golds to browns and stuff. Uh, I mean, and Sean's uh, like... <laughs> Sean is, I mean, he, he used to be a New Yorker, but now he lives in Vermont. He's just like a man of the woods. He's like an arty wow. DP man of the woods who I think really, um, you know, I didn't know him. My, my um, producer had worked with him before and shot something with him and, and, and had highly recommended him, him to me. Uh, and he just really was um, very well paired to the material. He's not a horror guy. He is like an art film guy. So for him reading the script, you know, that initial conversation, he, like all his references were like Tarkovsky. It was like the, the artiest, wow. most pretentious. He was like, oh, it should, the air should feel like the air yes. in, in Solaris and it should feel like Stalker in this, in this sense and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and the color palette thing is, is I mean, I, I have a favorite stalking horse uh, or whatever you call it, whipping horse or whatever on like the colors of modern film, because I think like it's not, an observation unique to me but like digital color grading i think has basically ruined 
one of the ways that film has been ruined um, because everybody just hits the dial to make every skin tone kind of orange and every light kind of um, whatever it's like cyan and orange or whatever because because the, they pair nicely on the color wheel. So when you can find a DP who's like gonna not do that, I think it, it just is always refreshing. And, and so there was, you know, I guess it's a, a roundabout way of saying very conscious of the colors uh, and very resistant to making anything sort of the standard palette that you might expect, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, tell us about um, uh, casting. I mean, you got two incredible actors as the leads. Yeah, so we, uh, <laughs> uh, so again, okay, I'll, I'll just expose all my stupidity as a director. I hate the auditioning process. I find it super embarrassing. Like I hate the idea of people coming in and like, like perform for me and I will tell you if you have the job. So instead of doing that, I um, said that we should, you know, go to agent, talent agents, whoever send the script out and, and just have people come in and we just have a conversation about, about it. And I would see who I thought responded well enough to the material. Uh, and part of that, I think, because <laughs> my, my refrain in, in, in talking about Larry's story is that it's so, um, open to interpretations. One of the things that in those meetings that I would do was ask them to tell me, like sort of tell me the story of what the script is and what they thought it meant, those sorts of things, to, to, just to sort of gauge how they had engaged with the material and, and those kinds of things. So, um, and that's how we cast both Rebecca and, uh, and Will Harper. Um, at the time, um, Mr. Harper had not been on the good place. He wasn't yet cheaty. He was, he was just like, you know, some, some actor who, who came in. I think, uh, he had been cast. I know he'd been cast in, in Jim Jarmusch's, um, Patterson. They hadn't shot it yet. Uh, and I know that because we lost him a couple of days while we were shooting. Cause he had to go shoot with Jim Jarmusch, which is really annoying when your actor is in literally every shot of your movie and then you yeah. can't be there for a day. Uh, yeah. so that's, when we did some of the other dream stuff, it's, it's the day that we didn't have Will Harper. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was it was really sort of as simple as that. I mean, kudos to my producers. I don't nor not normally a thing that you just have people come in and have a conversation and then say, I think we should go with that person. But um, it worked out pretty well. I think they're both great. Uh, I think Rebecca, yeah, I mean, they're both, I think, fantastic. There are a lot of, like, Rebecca did a lot of stuff that we ended up coming out of the movie where not cutting out but like she would she was very good at giving a range again to, to the sort of mutability of the story she would do takes where she was like like almost cartoonishly explicitly evil just just so we could see like like what that was and then we would and then we'd sort of dial it back from there to to a, a sort of more realistic i mean i don't even think the character is evil i think it's just sort of useful to have that range of, of performance um absolutely yeah D did you have them read laird's prose story or did you not want them to not uh no them? i did i said i sent them both uh and i think they both read it um i, I don't recall but I did, they had access to both yeah for sure very yeah. good last yeah. question i want to ask you about the the film is uh, the title uh they remain uh tell me about titling that was that a complicated process looking at options or did you yeah. did that come to <laughs> I'm, I'm not i'm honestly i'm not sure i don't think that phrase is from the prose story is it no, I don't, I don't think so. I hate, I hate titling things. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it so much, so much. So for a long time, it was called 30. And then um, somebody at some point told me I had to, we had to change the title. And then it had, I mean, probably like 20 titles before we settled on They Remain. Um, it actually, for a time, was titled What Remains, which is the name although you wouldn't know this from watching the name of one of the sequences in Spine of Night. Coincidentally, it had it had the same uh -huh. title. So I was like, we can't call it what remains because that's in the other movie that we're making. Yes. Um, so I don't, I don't even remember whose idea they remain. I don't have no, I, to be honest, I have no idea where that title came from. I love it, but I, I don't I don't know where it came from. Yeah, it's uh, probably, yeah, somebody whispered it behind you from the line, uh, the yeah, tree line. Yeah. I mean, I, I really like 30 as a title, to be honest. Um, and but, it's dash, yeah. it's like dash, dash, three, zero, dash, dash. Yeah, yeah. Laird, Laird, what is that? What, what's that referred to? It's like a journalistic thing. Is that right? Right. And it was to signify several things. Titles are important to me. And I'm the opposite of Phil. I love titling things. <laughs> that's actually one of my favorite things to do is to, because I feel like that's how you can, you can use it. So there's so many different ways that you can deploy a title, but 
don't want to digress. Um, <laughs> there's just so much pressure on a title. I can't. There is. Well, especially yeah, for what you're yeah. doing. But yeah, in a collection, yeah. there's no, there's like no, no pressure. It's just a, it's a title. The pressure comes like for me would be my version of a film would be the book. Yeah. Yes. But even yeah. then, I enjoy it. I really, I really like it. But um, yeah, it's it means the end. It's the sign off. It used to be the end of a piece of. And I'm like, all right. And it was going to be the end of the collection, but unbeknownst to me, my publisher had taken uh, one of the stories that I gave him, we were supposed to do, and I kind of even did it, a collector's edition of the, of the collection. And that was going to be the, the extra story, the story called 666. Yeah. So I was just like, yeah, the, 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 the mainstream, you know, the, the trade paperback, trade hard, you know, the hardcover would, would end on 30, but that didn't happen, but it didn't, I wasn't really, I wasn't really all that worried about it because it also means the end. So within the story itself, that's it. This is maybe not the end, but it's the end of your life as you knew it. Also, it's the caliber of um, the rifle. Of the rifle, yeah. Of the yeah. trank gun. Oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now I didn't, I didn't make that connection there. Also, it also kind of in a weird way works with the the collection because I, I do a lot of work making the collections fit together cohesively, and thirty odd six. So it's it's if, if you look at the it's, it's the next last the, the penultimate story in that in occultation is thirty. Then the next story is six six six. Well, yeah. there's a caliber of rifle actually. My dad <laughs> used them to, in the war and to hunt, all, or not in the war, but to hunt all the time. It was a it was a, a war you know a, a popular uh, military rifle back in the day. And it's thirty odd six. So you've got thirty and then six six six. There's just it doesn't quite, but it's that's fine. It's it's this weird little thing that it slices into your brain just a yes. little bit like yes. it's like an optical illusion like you'll you'll see that so yeah, yeah. Uh, i love that that's awesome well let's jump to the to short form cinema phil you've scripted i believe 25 of the 35 episodes of love death and robots um and and one of those episodes is an adaptation of alan's story in vaulted halls entombed from his 2019 collection served cold um, well, first, Alan, tell us about the story. What do we need to know about it, just from a plot and character perspective? Oh, okay. Um, so the story, it was originally written for the, the uh, there's an anthology series that are all SNAFU, S-N-A-F-U, the uh, acronym, and there's a whole bunch of different volumes. Um, and it was originally written for one of those, and, and the general remit for those stories is a high action, military action monsters, basically. Um, that I always sort of want to try to bring something a bit more than just that, you know, the surface sort of instruction to a thing. Um, and this story it follows a group of um, special ops Marines as they're tracking a group of um, insurgents in Afghanistan. And <clears throat> the story opens, they've been following them for some time and they see this, um, this group of terrorists go to ground in a cave system in the middle of nowhere. They've tracked them for days. Um, and so they then contact base and they say, you know, like, this is where they've gone. We don't know if it's one way. We don't know if they can come out again or not. If we go in after them, obviously, we're going to lose comms. What do we do? And of course, base says, go get them. Um, so that's that's what they do. The squad follows these terrorists down into the caves and um, things get progressively worse for everybody as they go because <laughs> things far worse than terrorists in those caves. So that's, that's the basic sort of premise of the story. Yes. Um, Phil, I mean, there are tens of thousands of available science fiction, fantasy, and horror tales. How do you even begin to select stories for a season of uh, Love, Death, and Robots? Uh, I mean, do you have specific criteria that you are looking to meet with that? Uh, and then and, and then what drew you to this story in Vaulted Halls and Tuned? Yeah, so uh, Love, Death, and Robots comes about uh that story selection process has a lot to do with specifically tim miller who's the lead sort of producer on the show has read a ton of short stories uh and has particular like particular tastes and what he thinks can adapt so uh i'm quite sure that uh because i so I, I didn't pick involved in halls and tomb but i will say when it came to me to adapt i was incredibly excited because it's exactly the kind of stuff I love. And yeah. I, Alan and I have never talked about it before. So I'm, I hope you like the adaptation, Alan. I don't, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know if this is a trap and you're going to be like, well, that sucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's interesting. Like 
um, <laughs> you, you did a great job. You did a great job of it. Um, it's interesting, like, like talking about, you know, talking to you on the phone for a couple of hours and this, yeah. that and the other. I, I was um, going to say, a, it's a very, it's going to be interesting. It's a very, very different process, Love, Death and Robots. Yeah, I yeah, saw, yeah. I didn't know anything about the adaptation until the series dropped on Netflix. Yeah. I had my kids sitting here playing Minecraft while I ran in. <laughs> to the other room and put the tv on. it was 5 p.m australian time when netflix dropped the series oh, wow. and i ran in to watch it to see i hadn't i'd seen nine stills um from the production um until i saw it along with everybody else so yeah that my my <clears throat> you know i the, the story was 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 bought to be adapted and then the next thing i knew about it was when the series dropped and i got yeah. to see <laughs> i got to see it wow. so uh, so, so what I can say about the story selection is, you know, um, uh, like a, a lot of it, in, in fact, the vast majority of it is sort of filtered through Tim's taste and Tim loves those snafuish collections. So I'm quite sure that he had read, um, that he read Vault and Halls Entombed in one of those. And then, you know, I, in the first season, we only really got to do one again, also, uh, like horror is a part of the DNA of that show, although I wish it was more a part of the DNA of the show, because we really, in the first season, had only done um, one that I would consider to have, well, I mean, one or two that had any horror DNA in them at all. So um, when It Involved with Halls and Tomb came around, I was particularly excited about it because I love horror stuff and I love, um, you know, the sort of intersection of like purpose-driven military men encountering like as you say like a, 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 something that they can't you know their their way of dealing with the world it's just not you know it's not compatible <laughs> really uh so that was a lot of fun um and a lot of fun to write I mean it, it was it, it's it's funny Elle, that they didn't set, tell you anything about it because like my from my perspective it's like I do you know the scripts you know there's there's some discussion about what stories we're going to do and then it gets decided and then I start to do the adaptations and I did, um, I have to go back and look. I probably did like, I don't know, six or seven drafts of an adaptation. And a lot of the drafts, I didn't, I didn't put them in a notebook. It was a much, <laughs> much, a much more efficient process. I would, I would, um, for all the stories I, I have, generally speaking, the short story up, I've got like a wide monitor, the short story up in one screen. And then I go right into a draft in the others in the other panel and just sort of take you know just reread the story and port stuff over into the script and then put the short story away and then just work from what i've taken from it to, to, to develop script anyway my point being i don't even really I, I didn't know which draft of the script like they were going to use until until i saw the final one too and i was like oh that's wow. that like here are the changes they made because sometimes there's changes, you know, in, in the animation process. Um, so just a very, very different process, even for me, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the, the layered adaptation. So um, anyway, not even sure that's really what you asked, but. No, uh, <laughs> but no it's really, it's, it's interesting. And it, and it brings up um, the, the fact that there are some significant differences between Alan's story and what ended up on screen. Um, and I, I, Alan, I, I wonder if, if you know what, what differences did you notice? Um, and um, I'm, I'm just I'm kind of curious to know. Well, in particular, Phil, which of these changes are ones that you authored, and and maybe which of them are things that came up in the animation process yeah. that yeah. Uh, even surprised you, Alan? Anything in particular that jumps out at you that was quite different? Yeah, I mean, there there was a couple of sort of fundamental changes. Um, uh, I mean, despite the fact that it's a short, there was a sort of there was a slight sort of compression into the um, the you know when they're in the story as they're traveling through the caves and things are getting worse, it's it's a little more drawn out. You know, there's a little more sort of building sense of dread. Um, whereas in the sort of short film that you know that you keep the pace up, things happen, bang, 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 things happen quickly. Um, probably the most significant change was uh, there's there's sort of two main phases to the. To the story in the first instance when they're traveling through these tunnels um and then when they burst out into this huge and confounding sort of underground you know temple almost it turns out to be a you know a giant prison of a kind um and in the in the tunnels the the sort of monster the beast creatures that they're fighting are these sort of huge glassy amorphous blobs that kind of absorb the flesh off bones um, whereas in, in the film version, that became a swarm of small kind of 
spider things. Um, uh, and I don't know why the changes may be in the, from an animation point of view or whatever else, but that was the only really sort of significant change in terms of like content of what was going on. Um, and from people who've spoken to me, that's probably the the thing that people bring up more than anything else is, you know, why why was why was it, you know, the swarm in the tunnels and not the glassy blob things? As I, <laughs> don't know, I tell you. <laughs> uh, I hold um, on, I'm gonna I'm gonna see who's responsible for that right now. If I can find my if I'll see yeah, how organized I, my folders I, are. I kind of like to know that because I would think it'd be easier to animate a blob than it would uh, thousands of these little spider-like creatures with human faces. Um, yeah and it also it also makes more sense when they do try to sort of you know shooting a swarm of tiny things kind of doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense whereas shooting one giant big blobby thing that's chasing them in the hope that they can yeah. you know what well, it kind of makes a little more sense from that point of view um equally the you know being swarmed by these things was was pretty effective um in terms of film anyway so yeah i mean it's, it's horrific i mean there's a moment yeah. where the swarms coming over the first guy to drop and he, you know one of the soldiers is reaching out to grab his hand and his hand just comes up off of his body as the, the rest exactly. of, as so it's very effective in that respect and it's yeah. kind of it, i mean it's written in a similar way in the original story where this where this, this blob kind of overwhelms them in, in much the same way but you know the sort of the the dynamics of it are obviously sort of quite different in terms of that change yeah. um so you know there's that's that is you know in visually and sort of action point of view is the uh is the only real sort of fundamental change and otherwise in the story the character of harper in the story um doesn't look on the, the chained god at the end yes so yes. in 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 the story the sergeant loses his mind but the harper character doesn't look on it and and then it's very ambiguous at the end of the story whether they did look at it or not and subsequently sort of what happened whereas in, in the film version i mean she's there like emptying a clip into it like very clearly does look and is subsequently affected you know in, in that way um and that that's a, in you know in terms of story that's a much more subtle change because the net result and what happens at you know the very end of it is is kind of very similar in a way um only the film is a lot more kind of obvious and the, the written story is a lot more ambiguous on that front. But that, that, you know, that in terms of storytelling, that's a relatively small change um, when it comes to making something work for film, then obviously film is a visual medium. Writing the story, I could be very much in the Harper character's head about what was going on. So this this is the nature of the difference, you know, between, between prose and film, so. Yeah, I, I, to me, that was the most significant difference there. And I, I really wanted to get Phil's thoughts on this as well. Um, because to me, the, the fact that the the Harper character um, doesn't see the the bound God, as it's called in, in the in the film credits, um, but only hears a little bit of description from from the sergeant as the sergeant is looking on it. Um, to me is is really frightening in the prose story that really works well but then also in the film version seeing the bound god it's horrifying to look on so it's it's interesting that it's the exact opposite uh experience but both of them work very well in terms of generating fear to me i don't feel any thoughts on that uh yes although hold on now i'm i'm just juggling drafts of it to try to, to try to get an answer to our previous question so this is what i can tell you if you're curious okay. yes my original draft of it was 26 script pages long so uh and i think retained a lot more of what alan was saying in terms of the the build uh, in the tunnel downward it's much more about you know, that sort of suspense is retained more than in the, in the final draft in the final draft i have we've cut nine pages out of it so it's gone from 26 pages down to 17 pages um so that's uh and in the original draft insects are never mentioned so at some point in between one draft and another i don't think it was me i'm trying to remember somebody was like somebody came up with the insect idea and we switched that but i, I cannot remember why uh or or even who deployed that note um no. i don't think it was me um so I'm innocent in this case. In this case if, you, if you don't like the insects, I'm, I'm innocent. Um, I mean, so the issue of the ending is interesting because I do remember, I don't know if I have the drafts, but we, I remember uh, potentially doing more damage to the ending. I remember writing an ending 
where I was like, oh, we should just end the world and they should release, like the last thing we should see is like them like re releasing the God and like, let's just let's just make it apocalyptic at, at the end. Wow. Um, I don't <laughs> think anybody liked that idea because we clearly didn't well, do I mean, it. In, in <laughs> the original story, there's, there's an implication uh, that that's possible because the final part of the story, the Harper character is like mad and been discovered. Yep. Yep. wandering the desert and the final part of the story is the you know the military bigwigs going oh we can't get out from this this person what happened we're sending another team in yeah. tomorrow in case <laughs> you wanted to know so the you know the implication is there that it's all going to happen again and at some point someone's going to yeah. do something yeah, yeah. To cut the chains you know? yeah. So, yeah yeah so i have uh it's funny you said i have a draft here where that ending is here too where it ends with it ends with that sort of missive you know um uh, and yeah. i think that's the, the last draft I worked on ended with that. It, it had the um, unloading the pistol into it, and then it um, and then it cut to sort of that that final like just like type on screen that sort of said the same thing. Um, it, it's funny to talk about these two adaptations because they are both like weird fiction, you know, either fully or adjacent. But they almost could not be more different <laughs> than in, in in certain senses. In that, you know, in that involved at Hall and Tombed is really, you know, uh, very much about like, you know, it's like purpose driven characters with guns, like 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 yeah. you know, active like like men of action doing actions and like discovering something. And and um, even though we don't know what god it is or the exact circumstances, like it, it's clear this is a temple and it's clear what's what's held there. Um, so, and I bring that up vis-a-vis -vis the ending because like it, it you know, I, I really, I can see it both ways. Like if if you were to do the 30 version of Involved Halls and Tombed, then you absolutely should not see what's in that temple, right? You, you, it, should, yeah. it should all be implication and it should all be, um, you know, sort of un unknowable and, and exist, you know, via, you know, a, what is it? Like a horrible, a cruel of, morbid detail or something right but if you're doing the like love death and robots version of it then you you, you better damn well see the, the, the giant <laughs> the giant god and, and somebody totally. better shoot at it right totally. because that's that's sort of what you're what you signed up for i think um it's interesting with the film version i mean i was really pleased in many ways to, to see that because i wasn't sure how it was going to be interpreted in the way it's written one character does see it and one character doesn't yeah. and i wondered what, what you know how you would deal with that because it is very much that you could see you could show it on screen because one one character in the original story does just look upon it kind of thing yeah um so yeah i wasn't sure how you were going to handle it but i was kind of pleased when I, I saw one of the few stills that i saw was a still um of the god and it's like ah cool they're going to show it that's interesting and i was looking <laughs> real close well what have they made it look like you know so, yeah. um, i also thought um the the difference between in the pro story and the in the film version it seems like the pro story there's a, you've got a lot of time develop where we see um what, what, the sergeant's name is it Col colford coltard yeah yeah coltard uh, we see how um it seems to lean in on his character so much and what it takes to lead a team under the duress of war uh, so he's essentially a god among men, um, and and yet he's still defenseless in the face of this bound god. You know, when the actual god shows up, it's he he is powerless against it. Yeah. But it, it, in the film, it seems like um, it leans more into the, the the question: How do you protect yourself from madness? The madness that lies at the center of the world, and and the the answer for Harper, at least, is to blind and deafen yourself against it. So it did seem like the um maybe the the difference in focusing on um and having less time i guess to to look at coltard and a little bit more on on the protagonist and the film's case harper um maybe shifted a little bit in in in, in kind of the focus of the piece and i also wonder if there was like um some parallel between the the madness of exposure to cosmic horror uh, and and to um, PTSD and the uh, um, madness of war. And the I mean, I draw on that a lot anyway with a lot of what I do. Um, I really like to explore this idea of, you know, here we are, we're people, we're in charge of everything. And then oh, suddenly, fuck, what's this? This is just completely beyond our remit, you know, like a lot of my work just sort of explore that, like what happens when people come up against stuff they're entirely not prepared to come up against i mean the entire yeah. alex Kane trilogy of novels is kind of built on that principle someone who's 
you know, in charge of their life and then gets put in a situation where things get progressively bigger and worse and harder and more difficult and, and how people sort of rise to those issues. Um, but within Vaulted Halls Entombed, it was, you're right, you know, it was a lot about the interaction of the of the squad and their reaction to things and Coulthard's basically saying, this is what we do with soldiers, we take orders and passing that down to the others and going, this is what we do, this is what we're told, we don't ask questions. And, you know, there's there's the scene in there where he takes, he actually stops and takes a moment to um, sort of console one of the other soldiers who starts really losing it. There's a real sort of human moment with Coulthard again. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, sort of showing this ability, yeah, why he's, why he is a leader, <clears throat> you know, why he is sort of in charge. Yeah, of it's a remarkable moment because he is is a very hard person, and yet he can let this other guy, Spencer, who's losing his mind, um, just sob on his shoulder. Um, yeah, it, exactly. it is a Here remarkable you go. You're going to need this. Let's take a minute. It's all right. Okay, yeah. this is real. This is normal. Don't worry. Okay, let's go. We we've still got a job to do, you know. And it's like the the introducing that human element into the utterly inhuman is a lot of what you know that I like to sort of that I like to play with in those things and like I was quite pleased it was it was a little bit um lightly done but I was pleased they left in the the donkey line with Beaumont and you know yes. because that was another one where it's like this poor kid you know he's got this reputation because he took a moment to hug a nice furry animal and make himself feel better and of course, everybody's, you know, like as the story says, by the time this, the story got around, he was balls deep in the creature. And it was <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was really pleased that they kind of left this little reference in and that that made it through, you know, that they called him Donkey. Yes. Because it's those little, it's those little human details that really help to highlight the inhuman of what you're facing, whether it's war in itself or, you know, taking war to the ultimate allegory of a, of a bound elder god that's, you know, if released, is going to destroy everything. Yes, yes. I was actually made a note of that, Phil. I was so impressed that you kept the donkey joke. And and because it relies on about a, a paragraph of backstory in the prose version, and you were able yeah. to, to make it make sense within just like two or three lines of dialogue. I was very impressed with that. Yeah. Um, and Phil, uh, one other just general question here. Uh, at the end of the film, Harper is wandering into the desert. She's, she's cut, you know, cut her eyes out. Uh, stabbed herself in the ears, deafened and blind herself. And she's whispering in, an, well, the, with the subtitle on, the caption says, Harper whispering in alien language. And she's saying something. Do you know what it is that she's saying? Is is a particular no. language you had in mind? Wait, I'm and sorry, I, I shouldn't I have think... said no. I should have said yes, but I'm not going to tell you. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So, so well, this it's is interesting not... because I've been asked that a lot as well. A lot of people messaged me about the, the <laughs> when they watched the film and go, oh, what is she saying? What is she saying? And I said, you'll have to ask Phil to that. <laughs> uh, you'll have to, you have to commune with some kind of uh, unknowable God to get the answer. And then you won't exactly. be able to share it yourself. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And I, I think there's, there's even a, um, a credit for Deborah Wilson is credited as possessed Harper. And I assume it's like she's doing, that's the voice that she's making at the end there, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah. In bringing these two pieces together, I, I noticed that the word count between them, at, at least in my view, is, is not that different. Um, 30 is about 16, 17,000 words. In Vaulted Halls and Tombed is about 8,500 words, just a rough, rough count there. Um, both of them would fall into the novelette category based on the science fiction writers of America um, categorization, and yet um, 30, 30 being twice the length of vaulted halls um, on screen, it's, it's a difference of 15 minutes to 100 minutes. So can you, uh, Laird and Alan, just to start off with, can you talk about the difference in the structure? I mean, Laird, before we, before we started recording, of course, you'd, you'd mentioned that, you know, even a few thousand words can make an enormous difference. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that, the difference in the length of these two stories and how that ends up um, mapping to what we see on screen, which is a short film versus a feature film? I can't speak to the screen part. That would be Phil, but... Um... I can speak to my impression of the difference, like when I'm creating a story between the various word ranges and right, it's, I don't write flash fiction very often. So I look at stories that are 5,000 words and under 5,000 words to about 8,000 and then 8,000 to about 15, 16,000 and then anything longer. And the reason that I break it down has almost nothing to do with, as you aptly point out, SIF was categorizations for the different types of, you know, whether it's a novel, novelette, novelette, 
short fiction, uh, short story or novella. Uh, I look at it, how I create the shapes of stories or the acts in the stories. And I look at it kind of as, as runway. Like if you're looking at it as a physical artifact, I have X amount of room to take this plane off. And what kind of plane, depending on the length of runway, what kind of plane, how heavy can I create it? Uh, the longer the runway, the more room I have to take off and land again and take off. Um, so for me, it's not even a big difference between eight, say 8,500 and 15, 16, 17,000. It is literally uh, a gulf. I can do, I actually consider the difference between, for me, what I can do with a 7,500 word story versus a 9,000 to 10,000 word story to really be perhaps subtle for the reader, but for me, it's magnitudes wow. of, room, of wow. room to work with. Okay. So I, I'll leave it at that. But I, I experience it as dramatic differences. Even literally even 500 to 1,000 words is a dramatic difference at the shorter length. Now, when you start talking about you get over a certain, you know, you break a certain threshold. Like for me, if I'm up over 12, 13,000 words, obviously I actually don't feel it five, 600 words, or even a thousand words becomes quite as prime a real estate or quite as potent. But certainly under novella length, the difference of 8,000, you know, double the length I can, it's, for me, it's exponential. I can, I can give you five times the story, not twice. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what Les says. It's it's a huge difference. Um, in Vaulted Halls and Tombs is is yeah. You, you said it's it's around nine thousand words, um, and for me that's still in short story territory. Uh, I, I guess a, a sort of a good example with my books, The Gulp and The Fall. They they each book each contains five stories that are all set in the same place, and all five of those stories in both all, all ten of those stories in both books are all between the sort of fifteen to twenty thousand word mark. They're all in that sort of novelette novella ballpark. Um, and each of those stories is, is very much a feature. Each story stands alone. You know, they interconnect, characters interconnect, but each story is very much um, a feature that stands alone. And any one of those would easily make at least a sort of an hour of television, if not a full feature length film. Um, and there's no way I could have told any of those stories even close to the same way if I was writing them as short stories. If I was trying, if I was writing them as sort of the, 5,000 to 7,500 word mark, they would, they would be fundamentally different stories. Wow. There would, wow. would be a very big difference in, in what I could do and what I could say and what the, you know, what character development you can have, what backstory and subplot you can have. Um, so yeah, ab absolutely. It, it is a golf um, from my point of view in that. Like in Vaulted Halls Entombed at around 9,000 words is a long short story, mm. but it is, it is that short story kind of ballpark uh, and I and that's you know like I mentioned with that sort of drawing out of the suspense as they as they're descending deeper and deeper through the tunnels and they're looking like how the hell can we be this deep this doesn't make sense and all that kind of stuff that's what filled a lot of the word count of leading into that sort of thing um and I could potentially have told that same story in 7,000 7,500 words it would be abridged to a degree but I would still get the same amount of um, I would that all all the story would still be there. The, like the vibe might be a little bit different. The the timing and the sense of tension would be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, even though you know, fifteen hundred two thousand words out of nine thousand is is a massive chunk. It's still in that short story territory. Um, I could quite easily have drawn that story up the other way into more like the sort of fifteen sixteen thousand words. But in that case, that it, I would be telling entirely new story in that sort of workout i will be telling an entirely differently structured tale with wow. a lot more backstory a lot more detail a lot more character development but the whole the whole thing the whole feel and vibe of that piece would be entirely different um so yeah so i'm yeah i'm with led anything basic i mean like i said nine thousand is, is a is a is a top end of a short story but for me anything up to about that eight nine thousand words um, is a short story. As soon as you get close to ten thousand words and you start breaking that barrier, it, it's an entirely different beast. It, it, you know the, the 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 whole sort of feel and vibe and structure and everything you can do with the story becomes very different, and it becomes more like the feeling of a small novel rather than a long story. Um, and for me, that's a huge tipping point. Yeah. But and so Phil, weigh in on this. 
is is word count what really makes the difference here between adapting something as a short film versus a feature or or, or is it is it is it scope of the material density of the material i mean how do you see this yeah i mean i don't i don't want to say it's completely removed from word count but it could very easily be removed from word count i mean i sort of think of it there's this like it's probably an apocryphal story and it doesn't relate one to one but there's like a what is it the making of the ten commandments or something do you guys know the story and it's like the mm -hmm. the ad is i see cecil, cecil b demille is that he see whoever directed it the ad is like mad because they've been they're like we're only shooting one line of this movie it's taking it's taking us three days why is it taking us so long and the one line is moses parts the red sea right so it's like it really it really like it just matters, it matters what the words are ultimately yes. like in yes. terms of like what you're the scope of what you're doing and, and on the screen and how much how much um screen time is going to take up um so yeah i mean i think it, i think it really just it, it, that's sort of my answer it really just depends on what's in those you know what's in the very short story or what's in the very long yeah. um novel or, or, or whatever you know that's a, that's a point i was thinking of and phil kind of articulated it uh to the point of you can get more story in in a longer story that's true. I, you can do that, right? You can have parallel plots. You can add extra characters. You can do all this, all this stuff. You can have red herrings. You can go. You can have digressions. But one thing that you can do, and this is what happened with Thirty, is you can also actually tell a more languid story. In other words, you could actually tell. You can have a story that's five thousand words that could probably be a three-hour movie just with the density of stuff that's in it. I've written a novel in a five thousand, seven thousand word story before. 30 is not a novel. 30 is literally a language, 15,000 words. It's designed to have all this empty space in it or, or space that's that's naturalistic, that you breathe, that you're, you're immersed in it. There's not a lot of parallel stories going on. So that was just one thing I want to toss in that you, but you still, that room is useful because you can, now I can develop the dread that he, that, that uh, Alan keeps talking about, about descending, right? You can you can use that to reach a crescendo that you cannot reach in a in a, in a short piece of fiction. Interesting. I, I just love the juxtaposition because both of them are about descents into madness, but they're they're so different. They're so different in in nature. One is so very mysterious the entire way through the thirty, and then you go to vaulted halls. And it's so tactical in nature, and you're seeing exactly what these soldiers are doing, and then it's getting weirder and weirder until then the madness really opens up at the end. It's fascinating, Phil. With the success of uh, Love, Death, and Robots, and um, and maybe maybe uh, with uh, Guillermo del Toro's Cabin of Curiosities, do you think there's a um, possibility of seeing like an animated series for horror short stories, the same way we've had with Lo uh, Love, Death, and Robots, which leans more in the science? Well, at least it's more open, you know, science yep. fiction, some horror, and and some fantasy as well, but more on the science fiction. Side. Yeah, way way more on the science fiction side. I also wish we did more fantasy. I keep asking to do something with a sword, and we just haven't really done it. Um, uh, my short answer is yes. I well, yes. We, I like a hopeful yes. I, I think um, animated horror is a real um, tricky thing, and that there really isn't that much of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like with the with the one caveat being sort of Japan, because Japan tends to do all genres in animation to the to yep. their credit. But um, but in the West, broadly speaking, uh, you know, we don't do it. A lot like you see um shutter did a, like a couple animated episodes of uh creep show and there's a Junji ito um show coming out that i think is western yep. produced but um there's so little of it um which to me means there's an opportunity right because there isn't because there is so little of it it feels um a bit wide open if you can you know find the right um the right people to do it and you can you can if you can find the audience and those kind of type of things so uh, I, I mean, it's something I thought about a, a lot in, in terms of, um, you know, what to do, you know, having done Love, Death, and Robots and having done Spine of Night, um, I would love to do an animated horror thing. And, it, you know, so I'm trying to figure, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> so, awesome. Okay. Well, yeah. you heard, you heard it here first, folks, on Cathonica. <laughs> um, that's terrific. Uh, uh, Phil, so uh, uh, as we wrap up, in, um, what do we have to look forward to from you next? 
Oh, uh, that's a really good question. I don't really know what will be uh, publicly available next. Uh, I, I can say I've been working with, I do video game work too. So um, oh, wow. of, of interest to the podcast listeners, I work with um, Frictional Games who makes um, the Amnesia series, like uh, those horror games. So I've been working with them on two games, um, one of which I think will be out relatively soon. Neither of them are announced, so I can't say what they are. I'll just say I've been working with them. And one, one is science searching and one is one is horror. Uh, and then um, I did a thing, which I guess I can't talk about either. Like I did a, I did a thing for HBO Max, which I hopefully will still exist and it will come out at some point. Uh, it's very different than anything we've been talking about here. So um, you can look for that as well. And um, that's sort of it. I mean, I've, I've got a bunch of other stuff I'm working on, but they're all, it's all so, um, you know, far in the future that it feels silly to even mention it. I would say if people haven't seen Spider of Night, uh, please go go check it out because I'm incredibly proud of how that one turned out. So what, uh, um, what uh, platforms is it on right now? Uh, Spine of Night is uh, available to stream on Shutter. Um, and then it is, uh, you can buy the Blu-ray on Amazon and uh, you can like rent it. You know, if you want to rent it to stream, you can do that on Amazon and Apple, Apple iTunes, whatever they call it. All the places. Yeah, yeah. It's an astounding <laughs> achievement. How, how long did you work on it? We worked on it. Um, we started on it uh, a year before I started the process of making They Remain. So eight years seven years wow. it was a long, wow. long 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 process yeah yeah it's amazing alan uh what do we have coming up from you next well i mean you just released sallow bend your novel sallow bend yeah yeah that that just came out um two weeks ago so yeah that that's the thing hope everybody gives that a look that's uh sort of weird creepy small town folk horror novel that just came out um and i've my and the, another novel i mean obviously what comes out is always behind what we're actually working on another <laughs> novel has just gone out on submission um uh which hopefully will find its home um so i've got my fingers crossed for that one um and i'm subsequently working now on uh, a new novel which is set in moncton which is in the in the gulf universe from those books from the gulf and the fall i'm i have sort of re returning to that sort of geographical universe i've created um that no, was deliberate you know i get to go back and, and play in that sandpit and so Goldpepper is the little weird <laughs> coastal harbor town and north and south of it is endon and moncton and most people go if they're smart they go straight from one to the other past the gulf and don't go in um so i've got a new novel that's set in moncton uh, that i'm working on at the moment but yes yeah, sallow bend is, is the current thing that's just come out so hopefully people will take a look at that awesome what do we have to look forward to you uh from you next a uh, bunch of stuff I can't really talk about, but suffice to say, really busy. So lots of stories, other projects, working on a novel. My agent has my next collection. And pertinent to um, Phil's interest, I've, a lot of the stuff that I have either coming out or I'm working on uh, features dark sword and sorcery. So lots of swords, monsters, that kind of thing. Yeah. The thing that I'm kind of excited about. I hate to privilege one thing over another that I'm working on, but because I'm working on it feverishly to meet my deadline, I'm working on a Coleridge novella and um, I'm kind of working on two veins of Coleridge. One obviously takes off from the novels, uh, just they're going to be novellas and another one is set in my antiquity. Uh, so they're alter egos of Coleridge, some of those other people. So it's as sort of reimagined instead of a private detective or a mob enforcer as, a, as basically sort of, you know, a, a cane kind of figure from Wagner era you know or, or, or like Isaiah Coleridge the eternal champion huh kind of <laughs> right it's uh like if he was born yeah. then but the thing that I'm working on right now though is that novella set in our set in our reality relatively and um also pertinent to our co uh co-guest here it's about Coleridge gets hired by a kind of a cult uh director there's actually a couple of them one's this Australian who made <laughs> Uh, made a certain film back in the 80s about cyborgs or uh, death robots but anyway they right. essentially have been working on this sort of a cosmic horror film and they borrowed some music from a cosmic horror a couple kind of folk rock musicians underground musicians i, I know this story <laughs> yeah and they and and they borrow the they borrow the music and it's just, it's a very creepy creepy movie creepy album but now they can't find the the directors can't find the um the guys they they they're in the wind and so they hire Coleridge 
you know, to, to go get him to sign the contract, essentially. <laughs> And so that's, yeah, that's what uh, that's what I'm working on right now. That's, that's awesome. And, and I think your your story collection that's uh, with your agent now does have an, a Coleridge novella in that as well. Is that right? May, uh, I actually that's going to end up being this, and it's going to be a standalone. Oh, gotcha. So, okay, very good. So th there's who knows what's going to happen between now and I, I had some plans, but they've met the enemy, contact with the enemy, and so who knows? Uh, she has to sell it, you know. Uh, but I don't think it's going to have the Coleridge novella, but it, the Coleridge novella will exist. So. Awesome. Uh, I, I mean, just a little bit of buzz I've seen about it on Twitter already. People are, people are eager for more Isaiah Coleridge. They're eager for more antiquity. I certainly, I know, I certainly am. So follow Laird um, on Twitter at Laird Baron. Um, follow Phil on Twitter at PM Jeepers. That's P M J E E P E R S. You got a story on that? I mean, it's just because my just because my initials are P M G, so I just turned the G into G first. Love it, love it. it. And then it's at Alan Baxter. Is that right? Yeah, just my name on Twitter. All right, yeah, uh, got lucky on that one. Awesome, very <laughs> good, gentlemen. Thank I've you. I've been on Twitter way too long. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's it. I guess that's it. When you got the at Alan or at Greg, you you know you were in that first uh, first year of Twitter. Uh, guys, yeah. thank you so much. This has been a blast and really informative, and is helping me understand a little bit better the process and complexity of um, adaptations. And I'm just eager to to read and watch more of your stuff. So, um, yeah, thanks again for your time today. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Absolutely.